I want to say again how thrilled I am to be here and to be able to, uh, to preach, how thrilled I am to be able to be before you. Um, Tim, if you're not aware, is he is at a ski resort in Utah, so maybe, maybe he'll run into some Mormons and maybe he'll have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. But we certainly should pray for him as he suffers during this time. That was a delayed laugh right there. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll be there for the bulk of our time this morning. But before we get there, there are a a couple of things I want to share with you in, in, in order to set the tone for our sermon this morning, um, the last time I, I was privileged to speak before you and to preach, we were in the book of Revelation. We talked about how God has a design for his churches, and sometimes in that design, he calls a church to repent. And so we've been in a season, really, since last August, where our church has looked at the scripture. And we have said that this year needed to be a year where we had repentance and revival and renewal. And so we've been in a sermon series. Uh, Tim has been preaching uh, through a sermon series called Repentance, Revival, and Renewal. And I was fortunate to be able to jump in on that series. And I know that Uh, Tim Forehand also was able to jump in on that series. And so here we are again, and I wanted to continue in that theme, but I wanted to be on the renewal side of it. Last time I preached, it was on the repentance side of it. And this morning, I wanted to be on the renewal side of it. And I wanted us to take an opportunity this morning to see Christ as revealed from the Scriptures. The, The medicine or the correct response when a church needs repentance is to fix its eyes, to focus its attention on Christ. And that's what I feel like we need. We need to return to our first love. We need to return to Christ like the church in Ephesus was called to do in Revelation. I feel like that's what we're called to do. Let's return to our first love, to Christ. So in order to do that, as a church, we need to have Christ put before us. And our text this morning, in so many ways, puts the greatness of Christ in front of our eyes. And we're going to be able to see Him. And we're going to be able to marvel at who He is. But before we do that, I want to set the tone with a couple of stories up front that will maybe help you see what I think the people who originally read the book of Hebrews, what I think they were going through. Or at least a, 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 a glimpse into why the author of Hebrews writes these things. So I'm going to read two stories up front. And they're stories of people who have been martyred for their faith in Christ. Or who have suffered for their faith in Christ. Some of you may have heard these stories before for some of you in here it might be completely new but I want to set the tone to prepare to look at Christ by reading these two stories the first story is about a man named Joseph and he was a Maasai warrior Joseph was a proud Maasai warrior living in eastern Africa when he first heard the gospel of Jesus Christ on the side of a hot, dusty road. In that moment, he dedicated his life to Christ and immediately made plans to share the good news with members of his tribe. Joseph went from door to door telling everyone about the cross of Jesus and the salvation it offered. He expected them to eagerly embrace Christ as he had, but to his amazement, The villagers not only rejected the gospel, they became violent as well. The men of the village seized him 
and held him to the ground while the women beat him with strands of barbed wire. Afterwards, he was dragged from the village and left to die alone in the bush. Joseph managed to slowly crawl to a watering hole, and there, after several days of passing in and out of consciousness, he gained enough strength to stand up. He was perplexed by the hostile reception he received from people he'd known all his life and decided he must have left something out or told the story of Jesus incorrectly. So after rehearsing his important message over and over, he went back to share his faith again. Joseph limped into the circle of huts and began to proclaim Jesus' love. He died for you so that you might have forgiveness and come to know the living God, he cried. Again, he was flung to the ground by the men of the village while the women beat him. Wounds that had just begun to heal were reopened. Like the first time, they dragged his unconscious body away from the village and left him to die. To have survived the first beating was truly remarkable. To live through the second one was borderline miraculous. But several days later, Joseph awoke in the wilderness, bruised, scarred, and determined to go back yet again. He returned to the small village, and this time they attacked Joseph before he even had a chance to open his mouth. And while they flogged him the third time, Joseph pleaded with them to seek the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Before he passed out, the last thing he saw was the women beating him had begun to weep. When he regained consciousness the third time, it was in his own bed. The men and women who had so severely beaten him were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health. And praise God, the entire village had become Christians because of Joseph's willingness to suffer on their behalf. The second one, is even harder in some respects. For years, Pastor Kim and 27 of his flock of Korean saints had lived in hand-dug tunnels beneath the earth. I don't know if you're aware of this. This is just a side note. But North Korea, they've recently released statistics and things uh, and North Korea is once again the most persecuted nation in the world for Christianity. This is its 18th year of being the most persecuted place for Christians. And this story will highlight some of that. They lived in hand-dug tunnels beneath the earth. Then, as the communists were building a road, they discovered the Christians living underground. The officials brought them out before a crowd of 30,000 in the village of Goksan for a public trial and execution. They were told, deny Christ or you will die. But they refused. At this point, the head communist officer ordered four children from the group seized and had them prepared for hanging. With ropes tied around their small necks, the officer again commanded the parents to deny Christ. Not one of the believers would deny their faith. They told the children, we will soon see you in heaven. The children died quietly. The officer then called for a steamroller to be brought in. He forced the Christians to lie on the ground in its path. As the engine revved, they were given one last chance to recant their faith in Jesus. Again, they refused. And as the steamroller began to inch forward, the Christians began to sing a song they had often sung together. As their bones and bodies were crushed under the pressure of the massive rollers, their lips uttered the words, More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. 
Thee alone I see, more love to thee. Let sorrow do its work, more love to thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry, my heart shall raise more love, O Christ, to thee. The execution was reported in the North Korean press as an act of suppressing superstition. Why am I reading these things to you? Because all over the world, Christians do suffer for the gospel of Christ. They do suffer for something we take so granted. You look even at the beginning when the church was forming. And Paul himself said in 2 Corinthians 11, 18 through 27, he lists the struggles that he had been through. He said, since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? Abraham, so am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, in hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And so we see that we are a blessed country, a blessed nation. Because I had no fear to stand before you a moment ago and say, we're going to look at Christ. We're going to see the Savior this morning. We're going to talk about Him today. And I have no fear of any military busting through the back doors. I have no fear of someone marching in with a gun. I know those things have happened uh, sparse across the country, but I have no fear of that today in the country we stand in. And that is a wonderful blessing. But far too often, we take, we take for granted those blessings that the Scripture revealed to us. We don't see Christ as beautiful and excellent because the surroundings around us are often very stable. And so this morning I wanted to set the tone as we are going to jump into Hebrews so that you see maybe a little bit of what the, the church that this was being written to says or what they were going through. And when we looked at Revelation last time I was here, John, he, had, he was the last apostle. Every other single one of them had died a martyr except for John. They tried to kill him, but they couldn't do it. The apostle Paul, who I read all the things he had experienced earlier, he was killed by being beheaded uh, by the Emperor Nero. But when we look at stories like that, we begin to see the difference between duty to a religion or a church or a government and genuine love for Christ. Someone who's dedicated to their church will come and worship with their church. They might even miss Super Bowl Sunday for their church. But they're not likely to suffer for their Savior. That's the difference between duty to a church, to a religion, and love for Christ. And so I want to put Christ before you this morning that you can see exactly who it is we're calling you to love. We're not called to vain beauty. We're called to love for Christ 
So let me read Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. And we're going to spend our time here. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. God, we do come to You. And Lord, we recognize that in this country we have it good. We can go all over and find Bibles. We can walk into church buildings and sing songs. They say, I need you, Lord, I need you every hour, I need you. We can sing those things without fear of persecution or physical suffering. Lord, we have it good, and that's a blessing from your hand. But Father, I pray that the same blessing you give us would not become to us a stumbling block in that We take your son for granted. I pray that you would help us to see him as exceedingly great this morning. That as we look at your scripture, as we see your son, we would be compelled to worship him. We would be compelled to praise him in these four walls and outside of this building. Do something with us this morning that we cannot explain away. Do something with North Clay this morning that will echo into the week and that will echo through the year that you are bringing repentance and revival and renewal to this people. Do something this morning to awaken us to love your Son. And it's in His name we ask these things and for His sake. Amen. Let me give you a few notes about the book of Hebrews before we start looking at the text and breaking it down. Now we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews and we really don't know who its intended audience was. But obviously... If you read the book of Hebrews, the audience had an in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. And that becomes more and more obvious the more and more you read in it. There is also reason to believe that wherever this church was, it was facing persecution. And that there were even some underneath that persecution who were walking away from Jesus. They might have had obligation to the church they were with. But when things got hard, they started walking away from Christ. And so the author of Hebrews writes this letter and he explains here in the opening what his goal is. See, throughout the whole letter, He is constantly comparing and contrasting Jesus with key people that he wants uh, them to know. He wants key people and events in Israel's history so that it stands as a backdrop for who Jesus is. And he has two goals. The reason why he keeps throwing out all these illustrations, why he keeps comparing and contrasting Jesus to to these key people and events is the first goal 
to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else. That's his first goal. He wants to see Christ elevated. And the second goal is he wants to challenge his readers to remain faithful to Jesus even through persecution. Now, we're only going to focus on these first four verses, but we're going to see enough here in these first four verses. And we're going to use those to see some of the comparing and contrasting that the author intends. So, in the first four verses, there are four comparisons that the author of Hebrews stands next to Jesus. He puts four things right next to Christ and he says, he says, look at this and now look at Christ. And he, it's kind of, you see the difference, right? And we're going to bring out those four things. He starts off verse one long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things. So the first comparison that He puts beside Jesus, He compares Jesus next to the prophets. Now, when I talk with the kids and when I explain to them what a prophet is, I oversimplify it, but it's a helpful illustration that I'll let you in. I ask the kids, what is a prophet? And some of them don't know. Some of them have been through the illustration before. And I'll tell them that a prophet is someone who heard God speak in a unique and in a powerful way. And then he took what God spoke to him and delivered it to the group. And I'll call up a child and I'll say, you're going to be my prophet this morning. And I'll whisper a message into their ear and then I'll say, now you be my prophet, tell the group. And so the child will then say the message that I gave them. And I'll ask the question to the kids, who gave you the message? And some of them will say, well, the child gave the message. Or some of them will say, well, you gave the message. And that's what I want them to do. I want them to see that the prophets, because of their position, were tied so closely to the Word of God that when you looked at a prophet's message, you said, that's the message of God. And so this first comparison that Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, puts right next to Jesus is the prophets. And, and let's just go through some of the prophets. We're, let's look at three of them. Uh, if I had to take a guess or a stab in the dark at who the greatest prophet was in maybe his action. I might say that it was the prophet Elijah. And the reason why I say that, there's a couple of reasons, but one of them being that Elijah appeared with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration alongside Jesus. But you look at Elijah, and let's, let's look at just one story from Elijah's life, and you don't have to flip there, but it's found in uh, 2 Kings, or excuse me, uh, 1 Kings 18. And it's the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And Elijah felt like he was the only prophet of God. And there were hundreds of prophets of Baal. And God impressed upon Elijah to go to the prophets of Baal. And he says to the prophets of Baal, let's have a test to see who the superior God is. We'll build an altar, but we won't light it on fire. And whichever God lights it on fire, that will be the superior God. And the prophets of Baal agree to it. They build the altar. The prophets of Baal cry for hours and hours. Send down fire, O great Baal. And Baal never answers. And we can tell you the reason why. Because there is no such thing as Baal. And then Elijah goes up and he prays to God. And God sends fire and it consumes the sacrifice and the altar and it licks up the water that they had poured around it. And so you see God as superior. 
and you see Elijah as a prophet of the living God. But right after that encounter, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, Elijah gets scared because Jezebel hates what's happened, and, and Jezebel goes chasing after him, and Elijah goes, and he, he hides from Jezebel, and God meets with him while he's there, while he's in hiding. And it's, it's in 1 Kings 19.9, he actually says to him, he says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What? are you doing here, Elijah? And he rebukes Elijah. So here we have perhaps the greatest acting prophet of all time, and he was rebuked. But Christ never received a rebuke from the Father. And then I suppose if we went into who was the greatest writing prophet of all time, we might look at Isaiah who wrote in Isaiah 53 the prophecy about the coming of the Christ and his suffering and how he would die to make atonement for sins. And we look at him and we say, yes, there is a prophet who was serving God, who was writing down and understanding things about God that would come to fruition thousands of years later. Yes, there is a prophet, but when we read Isaiah chapter 6, and he stands before the, or he, he's in the throne room in a vision before God. He falls to his knees, recognizing his own unworthiness. And he says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Christ never felt inadequate in the presence of God the Father. And if we go even further into the New Testament, and perhaps the last, well, it's not perhaps, but it is, he was the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist. And he was doing incredible things, baptizing, and it says that Jerusalem came to him, meaning everybody came to see John. He was baptizing them and telling them to repent, and people were coming in the thousands And John told them that he was not worthy to lace the sandals of Jesus. And in John chapter 3, verse 30, he even says, John says of Christ, he says that he must increase and I must decrease. So the author of Hebrews starts off by putting, by putting all these prophets, uh, Elijah, and Isaiah and John in our minds and say, look at how they pale in comparison to our Savior Jesus. The second comparison that he makes, or the second one that I want to, to pull out for you, it's not the second one in, in, uh, in terms of where he goes, but it's the second one I'm going to pull out. Uh, he goes and he compares them to the angels. And it says uh, in verse 5, we'll, we'll look at verse 5, it says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And we see Christ put beside the angels. Well, if, if he's greater than the prophets, is he greater than the angels even? And we look at some of the works of the angels and we look at, um, for example, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 19, when the angel of the Lord, one angel, goes up against the Assyrian army and he destroys over 8,000 men. Just one angel doing that. We see uh, stories of Michael, the archangel, who, who will lead the armies of the Lord I don't know if you remember this or not, I'm sure you do, but the devil even is a fallen angel. And so we sit there and think the power of these angels is great indeed. How does Christ stand up next to those 
And when we look at Hebrews, it says all these angels might have incredible power. They might have strength. They might have uh, holiness for those who are not fallen. They might have power, even for those that are still on the earth, roaring like a lion, seeking whom they may devour. But none of them are a son of the Most High God. And a lot of times, uh, I grew up uh, uh, listening to Carmen. Uh, anybody in here ever listen to Carmen? Yeah. I will also admit to the fact that I also did many human videos set to Carmen songs. One of the biggest, or probably the biggest Carmen song was the song The Champion. For those of you who don't know, let me break it down for you. He sets up the analogy that there's this boxing ring. And in the boxing ring, you have the Son of God, Jesus, and you have Satan. And they get into this ring, and they're duking it out. And Satan's throwing jab after jab after jab at the Son of God. And Jesus is blocking them. And this is an illustration that he paints. However, when I look at the scriptures, when I see the reality of the greatness of Christ versus the greatness of any angel, fallen or not, I recognize that Satan would not have stood in any boxing ring with the Savior. No, that's, that's a mismatch of epic proportions. We see where the matchup really would come with. In, in, in Jude verse 9, you have, um, you have where Michael the archangel confronts the devil. And Michael is kind of wanting to duke it out with the devil because they're having a dispute over the body of Moses. But then he looks at the devil and says, you know what? The Lord's going to do with you what he will. Because the reality is that when we put the Son of God up against any angel. Every angel pales in comparison to the Son of God. Our Jesus, our Savior, is far greater than the prophets. Far greater than any angel. The next thing, the, the third thing that the author of Hebrews puts in front of us, he compares Christ to creation and the rest of the universe. We'll look in verses 2 and 3. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, who he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. In other words, he created the world and he upholds it. The reason why we're on an earth right now that's not hurtling out of time and space as we know it is because Christ is upholding it. The reason why it's here for us to be here in, in the start, at the beginning, is because Christ created it. But creation is wonderful to look at. I was a student pastor at Ridgecrest Baptist before I came here. And we took uh, those students on a trip to the beach, we went to Panama City Beach, and there was one student with us, his name was Ephraim, and he had never been to the beach before. He'd never been out of his neighborhood before, but he had never been to the beach before. And he got to go with us on this trip, and we get to where we were staying, and Ephraim walks out onto the beach, and he just looks at the ocean, and his jaw dropped, he was in awe of what he saw because he realized in that moment, and it took him a long time before he was able to articulate this, but in that moment he realized just how small he is compared to the ocean. And who among us goes to the ocean and says, yeah, I can, I can handle that. Who goes to the ocean and thinks that 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 is tame, that that is something that they can control or they can put under their subjection. Nobody. Who goes to the Grand Canyon and looks at that 
huge chasm and thinks, I am greater than this. No one. And so when we put all of creation, oceans, to the Grand Canyon, or even the sun in its orbit that provides heat for our entire world, and it's not even the biggest one by any stretch of the imagination, you bring in the entire universe and you put that before any of us, we look at it and we feel small and we feel tiny. And the author of Hebrews puts the entire universe and creation right next to Christ and he says, see how superior your Savior is? He created these things. These things are upheld by His hands. And you have a Savior greater than anything else you can look at. So Christ, when compared to the prophets, oh, how great He is. When you compare Him to the angels, oh, how great. When you compare Him to all of creation, the universe, and everything around us, oh, how great He is. But the last thing that I want to pull from these verses that He puts in front of us is the most astounding of them all. And it's in verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. So then the author of Hebrews says, now let me take my Jesus, let me take my Savior, and let me put him next to God Almighty. And let's see how Christ compares. And he says, when you look at Christ, and when you look at God side by side, you are in awe of both because you say that Jesus is, our Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of His nature. And that should blow our minds. A man who lived here on the earth, who walked around with skin and bones on. A man who came here, who spoke with us, who ate with us, who drank with us. That man, when you stand him next to the, the great almighty God, this son of God is the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is great even in comparison to God almighty. Now this is the same God. You need to wrap your minds around this. This is the same God who created the universe, who parted the Red Sea. He spoke in thunder at Mount Sinai. He consumed Sodom and Gomorrah. He toppled the walls of Jericho. He came in a whirlwind to Job. He terrified Isaiah in his throne room, who has angels proclaiming day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is beyond equality. He is beyond any peer, and Jesus standing right beside him in comparison is equally as great. That is your Savior. That's Him. How great a love should we have for this Jesus. How great a love should we have for this one who is equal with God Almighty. And when we look at Him, and when we see Him in that light, we can almost begin to despair. Let me explain why. Because when we look at Christ, and when we see Him as great as He is, we can look at Him and we can say, He's too much for me. He's too great for me. I have nothing in common with this Jesus. And people all over the world have taken a look at Christ and they've said, since he's too much, we're going to have this be, be who we go to. And they create things like uh, a religion of Mary, where, well, Christ is too great. He's far above us. So let's go and let's pray to Mary. Because, because Mary was a human. We can understand Mary. She was a good woman. 
but we can understand Mary. Or even in the examples of Scripture, they see the greatness of God. And that always blows my mind in Exodus when the Israelites were at the foot of Mount Sinai and God descends to them, speaks in thunder and in lightning. They know who He is. And then Moses goes up onto the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And they stay there at the bottom. God is right there on the mountain with them. They stay at the bottom and they say, hey, let's, let's make an idol because that God's too much. And so when we look at Christ for who he is, we can despair. That is something that people have done all along throughout history. So how do we not slip into that? How can we keep our love of Christ where it should be, keeping him elevated, but also not despairing and making something else our idol or our God? Well, if we look just just one chapter over, in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, And this this should make all of us rejoice because it says here, for it was fitting that he, talking about Christ, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies And those who are sanctified all have one source. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. And we look at that passage of Scripture and we say, this great Christ, this great Jesus, he is so beyond beyond fathom, beyond equal. The only equality he has is with God himself. And this great God came and suffered and he came and he suffered and because of his coming and because of his suffering we can be called brothers and sisters with this great Christ we can and that is how when we look at Christ and when we see him for who he is far above prophets and angels and creation equal to God Almighty and yet coming here suffering bringing many sons to glory so that we we can be called sons and daughters and brothers and sisters with him how great a Christ we have, how great a love we should have for this Jesus who is all these things. This is our Savior. Maybe some of you are sitting there saying, yes, yes, I love him. I want to express my love for him. Yes, he is worthy of it. Yes, he has made a way for me to love him through his suffering, through making me a brother or a sister. So what do I do now? Let me bring it back full circle. We started off talking about people who were persecuted for their love of Christ. And let me bring it back to that point. That when you love someone or when you love something, you're going to be willing to sacrifice for that someone or that something. I'll give an example everyone in here, or most everyone in here can relate to. Many of you in here have had children before, and many of you in here have been woken up in the middle of the night by a child who is crying. And there is nothing about you that wants to get up and wants to go feed that child or change that child. You just want them to let you sleep. Why do you get up? Why do you go and take care of that child? Because you love that child. You're willing to do small amounts of suffering like that. (laughs) Some people, depending on how 
how bad of a sleeper your child might say small sleep. Many of us are willing to do that. But when it comes to our love for Christ, when it comes to our devotion for Christ, many of us will not even go into a conversation with someone about Christ at the jobs or in family or, or with friends because we're just afraid of offending them or we're afraid it's going to lead to an argument. We're afraid of these things. Many of us won't even talk about Christ. We won't even suffer an inconvenience. Now, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us. So this love of Christ Hey, yes, I, I can love him. But so what? I'm going to end with one last story that will hopefully highlight motivation for love for someone who's greater. Uh, there's a movie that came out in the 90s. It was called Braveheart. It was Mel Gibson who starred as William Wallace, and it was a story about how uh, the Scot how Scotland became free from English tyranny. And in that, there was a man named Robert the Bruce. He was a character in it. The reason why I bring it up is because most people, when they hear about the liberty of Scotland, they think of William Wallace because of that movie. Let me tell you, William Wallace wasn't the hero Robert the Bruce really was. So our story is really more about Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce was a king. He, he took over the kingdom for the, the Scots. He was the first one. And he was beloved by all his people. Beloved by all his people. And he fought and they won freedom. And so all of Scotland, they, they wanted to be there for Robert the Bruce. They wanted to express their love and gratitude for him. And on Robert the Bruce's deathbed, Robert the Bruce called in one of his closest friends and said, I want you to take my heart and I want you to bury it in Scotland. He had been away. Uh, he had been away at the time. He said, I'm nearing death. I want you to take my heart and I want you to bury it in Scotland. And that's not as weird of a thing as you might think. Many kings would do similar type things in those times. And Robert the Bruce, take my heart, bury it in Scotland. That's where my heart is. And that's what I want you to do. So, of course, the servant said, yes, yes, I will, I will take your heart there. And as he's going back to Scotland, they hear from a kingdom that they had peace with in Spain that there was a battle brewing there. So before they can go to Scotland, they had to go through this other army in Spain. And they walk up to the battlefield, and there is this friend of Robert the Bruce's. And what he did is he, he took the heart, he fastened it in a casing, he had it put on a necklace so that he always had it close to his heart. And so he walked up to the battlefield and they start to wage war with the other army. And they got too deep in the enemy's stronghold. They realized that they were surrounded all sides. None of the army was going to make it to Scotland. They were never going to get their king to where he needed to go. And this ally of Robert the Bruce this friend takes off the heart from around his neck and casts it into the middle of the battlefield. And he looks at the army behind him and he shouts, Fight for the heart of your king! And that army rushed the field, won the day, because they were compelled for love of their king. Why do I tell you that story? Because when you leave here, you need to know you have a superior king than Robert the Bruce. You have a superior savior to the prophets. You have a greater Messiah than creation. You have a higher Lord than angels. He is equal with God. So when we leave here, what should your love compel you to do? Go and live and fight for your king. And you can't do that sitting here. 
this is the last time you give praise and worship to Christ until you come back next Sunday when your love and your devotion has carried you no further than the doors of this building. So I leave you with this challenge in light of who He is, who Christ is, in light of what He's done. Go. Fight for the heart of your King. Love Him in these walls and outside of these doors. Go and live your life for Him. He is greater. He is worth it. So let's go live. Let me pray for you. Most gracious, most heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for so mighty and so great and so wonderful a Savior as you have sent in your Son. Father, I pray that through looking at your scriptures, we would start to have within us a swelling, a love of your Son that is unequaled, that's unmatched to any other thing we can say that we adore or any other thing that we say we love. God, I pray that our love for Christ would compel us to go out in this world and to live differently to be willing to suffer for your son's sake, to be willing to live a life that others look at and say they are living for something higher and greater and deeper and more meaningful than I have in my life. And Father, because of that love, because of that living, because of our willingness to suffer on behalf of Christ, because of our willingness to endure hardship for behalf of Christ because of those things we would see North Clay these people in this building right now that we would experience repentance and revival and renewal in your son Jesus Christ because he is our love let us return back to him and it's his son's name Jesus we ask these things and for his sake amen